Welcome to our Kamayan para sa Kalikasan Forum. We will begin with Zoom etiquette guidelines followed by an opening prayer and the Philippine National Anthem. Makakalikasang araw po sa ating lahat. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Medardo Pizarra, President of Norwich Brent Cedric School, who will guide us in today's opening prayer. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to your presence today. Please accept our praise. May your name be glorified all over the earth, for you have created the earth and you were satisfied for its beauty. Holy, holy, holy. We thank you for this new day that our speakers would speak about floods and mitigation. Give them wisdom, O God. We thank you for our health, sustained from the right food that you give each day. We thank you for the wisdom of our organization especially the leadership, for having chosen this timely topic. We request you, O God, to have mercy on us, sinners, and forgive us our sinfulness, such as the sin of selfishness and greed and the sin of not doing anything to stop the works of the devil. Speak to us, O Lord, so we can learn the lessons from Noah's Ark, such as that we must plan part of which is this afternoon's event, that it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark, that we must stay fit, that despite of our age, some of us have reached retirement age, we can still do something big for the future of our children, that we must not listen to critics, but do what must be done, that we must build on high ground, that for safety's sake, we must travel in pairs. That two heads are better than one, especially when we decide on things. That speed isn't always an advantage. The cheetahs were on board. And same with the snails. That if we cannot fight or flee, let us float. That we need to take care of our animals as if they were the last ones on the earth. That we should not forget that we're all in the same boat. This climate change is affecting everyone, everything. That when races get really deep, we must not just sit and complain, but rather take the shovel and act. That during the storm, we must stay below the deck. That we need to remember that the ark was built by amateurs and the Titanic was built by professionals. That you must, that if we must start over, have a friend by our side. That if we must fight the woodpeckers inside of us, which are often bigger threat than the storm outside. That we should act fast if we do not want to miss the boat. That no matter how bleak it looks, there's always rainbow on the other side. And we must stop what we are doing bad and do what you say, oh God. 
In the name of Jesus, let us say, Amen. Hi. Isang makakalikasang pagbati at mainit na pagtanggap sa inyong lahat. We are happy to welcome you to the 411th Kamayan para sa Kalikasan Forum, the longest-running environmental forum in the Philippines. We are talking about 34 years of continuing monthly forums, or fora if you prefer, Kamayan para sa Kalikasan is brought to you every third Friday of the month by Green Convergence, or GC for short. For everyone's information, we are currently live streaming at the GC Facebook page, and a video recording will later be available for viewing at the GC website and YouTube channel. I am your moderator, Marie Marciano, a founding member and former vice president of GC, and a lifetime volunteer of many other worthwhile causes and organizations. So a friend suggested that under works at, in my FB profile, I should write here, there, and everywhere. Kalad ka po kasi ako, basta meaningful ang project, and I will continue to go where God sends me. And now I am uh, about to introduce I'm happy to introduce to you our uh, co-moderator. Currently, he is a member of the Board of Trustees of Green Convergence. At the same time, he is president of the Green Party of the Philippines, vice president of Bayanihan Para Sa Kalikasan Movement, Inc., the host of Bosses ng Kalikasan, and a content creator and influencer. And here he is. Please welcome David D'Angelo. Kalikasang uh, araw po sa inyo lahat. Hi, Miss Marie. Long time no see, no? Uh, oh. Ngayon, okay na tayo. <laughs> Wala na kumagat na bis sa atin. Last time, eh, nagkaroon tayo ng problema doon. <laughs> Good yeah. afternoon, everyone. Dami natin Miss ka namin uh, last time, but it's okay. <laughs> You're here now. So you were saying, David? Uh, yeah, welcome po to everyone who are attending the Kamayan today. I'm sure we have members from various organizations that are already members of Kamayan uh, and Green Convergence and also people from the government and the academe. Welcome to a very, very interesting and timely topic for today's Kamayan. Okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> okay, let's get on with the forum. To give us an overview of our topic today, please welcome an esteemed leader of the Philippine Environment Movement, one of the strong pillars of environmental education, and the president of Green Convergence, Ms. Victoria Segovia. Good afternoon, Vicky. Thank you, Marie. Magan mag Good afternoon, everyone from the City of Smiles. I am here now in Bago City, Negros Occidental. Last oh. month, and just last week, up to Wednesday this week, I don't know if it's the same there with you, but here in Negros, we have witnessed a downpour of rains from Luzon to Mindanao. 
brought about by Typhoon Karina, Hiner, and Helen, and the Habagat. The reports say that Karina alone affected more than 3 million people around the country. We all know the inconvenience and harm brought about by these rains, landslides, death, evacuation, like here in my place, uh, some people from the villages evacuated in the, in the city center, loss of properties, displacement, and the like. These are accompanied by the destruction of crops, cancellation of classes and offices, etc. I used to stay in Malate, Taft Avenue, where life gets disrupted every time there is heavy rain because for sure people will be seen wading in the flooded streets as I had experienced several times. So we are very lucky today that we can hear from the experts how to understand this phenomenon and more, how can we cope through mitigation and adaptation strategies so that our lives can, can continue with little disruption given our natural condition and the condition of our water resource systems. Thank you to our speaker, to Dr. Guillermo Tabioso, to the DPWH uh, representative, I think it's Jerry, and to Professor Carmelita Liwag. Thank you very much for being with us and helping us to understand the phenomenon of flooding and giving us lessons on how we can help ourselves adapt to this. No? Uh, so, fellow lovers of the environment, let us relax, take a deep breath, thank God we are alive and able to learn something new today. Listen attentively to our expert speakers who will enlighten us further about this pestering phenomenon in our Filipino lives, the floods. Magandang hapon po and happy listening. Thank you, Vicky, for that overview of today's discussions. But before we plunge into our topic, allow me to give you a short rundown of the program flow. The forum has two major parts. Part one consists of the speaker's presentations to be given without Q&A interruptions. And part two is the open forum where you can freely ask your questions to be answered directly by the speakers concerned. Since questions will not be entertained during part one, it is advisable to write down your questions to be sure you don't forget. That's it. And of course, uh, we do have uh, participants guidelines for everyone. So we right. not time very strict, but for the forum to be really uh, fruitful and the discussion to be meaningful. Uh, we are requesting uh, everyone to avoid distracting ambient noise. All participants are requested to keep your microphone on mute for the duration of the forum, except during, of course, the time when you are about to ask questions. And you are welcome to speak and ask questions. Meantime, you may use the chat box for comments, reactions, or messages. Enjoy the forum today, and I hope that we can really have insight on this very important uh, societal problem and environmental issue that we are facing. Okay, we can move on now, and we're going to begin uh, presenting our speakers. Our first speaker is recognized for his significant and outstanding contributions in the field of civil engineering, specifically in hydrology, hydraulics, and water resources systems engineering. His pioneering work on two-dimensional hydraulic modeling using finite volume method, or FVM, has been applied to river restoration projects in Kissim Kissimmee. <laughs> That's so cute. Kissimmee River in Florida. Moreover, his optimization simulation model studies include optimal water allocation of competing water uses of the multi-purpose Angat Reservoir hydropower 
optimization studies of the Ambuclao, Binga, and San Roque reservoirs in Agno River. Project sequencing and staging alternative reservoir system configurations in the Kaliwakanan Agos River Basin to aug augment Metro Manila's water supply. He authored the book, Water Resources Systems of the Philippines, Modeling Studies, published by Springer International. Friends, we are uh, proud to present Dr. Guillermo Tavius III. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Marie. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll talk about the Philippine setting, a little bit about the archipelago, as well as the uh, some the weather, the climate, and so on. And then I'll get into how I think we can address flood floodings in the context of flood risk management. So there's an approach I'm going to talk about, transdisciplinary approach, and then get into some sample studies or ideas I have as far as the flooding uh, <clears throat> solutions. I'll end up in there after that. So let me begin by looking at uh, the country, which is uh, it's in a humid tropic. That's number one. And then it's archipelagic. So if you think in terms of uh, being a flood-prone uh, disaster country, we've got all the elements of uh, you know mechanisms of flooding. As far as the humid tropic is concerned, we have this... Uh, very uh, intense rains coming from typhoons, monsoons, and then we have this, uh, what we call the intertropical convergent zone because we are near the equator. We get lots of rain also coming from that. And then of course we have this uh, extreme temperatures or hot temperatures in summer, so we get thunderstorms. So they result in really large floods. And then, once you get a lot of rain, gets into your rivers or your floodplains, the land, which is the medium of your water flow, we've got steep uh, slopes. Because being archipelagic, we have this uh, 600 meter high uh, Sierra Madre, for example, and a matter of uh, 20, 30 kilometers, we get, we, it's already the coastal coastal area. So that's quite steep slope as far as uh, uh, rivers are concerned and uh, hydrologic uh, <clears throat> flood uh, floodways are concerned. So in addition to that, we, 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 we have to think that because of this large uh, rainfall and then we have steep slopes, we are really prone to soil erosion. So we have a lot of these sediments coming from the mountains, the watersheds, get into the rivers, it then shallows the river. It shouldn't swallow the river, it should shallow the river as far as that. And eventually the passing to the coast. So for example, if you look at the, as far as the rainfall mechanisms are concerned, we have this typhoon, like for example, Ondoy, we have a fast moving storm that occurred essentially passed through Metro Manila in one day, in fact, just like maybe six hours. So this is the typhoon uh, path during the time. It entered uh, somewhere in Fanta, maybe uh, seven or six in the morning, and then went through Sierra Madre. Metro Manila was uh, hit around eight or nine. Two o'clock, it's already gone. It's a fast moving storm, but very intense. Now, the other uh, rain mechanism that's even more devastating, we have this uh, habagat. If you look at the habagat uh, case, it's associated to the Karina. But if you look at the Karina uh, typhoon path, it's really far away from Metro Manila, for example. If you look at this, about five degrees, it's about 500 kilometers away on the west, I mean, the east side of, uh, east, uh, northeast of Metro Manila. And then it was going through this area maybe three days. 
but that brought rains in Metro Manila for seven days. That's a typical, we call it a sham sham kind of a event where uh, we have plenty of rain. And in fact, if you look at the rainfall during Ndoy, in six hours, we got 380, 24 hours, about 450 during Ndoy in, in Quezon City. But here, we have the height of the storm, 400, 500 millimeters of rainfall in 24 hours. And then over a period of seven days from July 19 to 26, some areas total rainfall 1,000 millimeters. So when you think about uh, flood control, we have to really design our flood control structures, not only based on a single peak, uh, short duration storm, but we have to think in terms of Habagat systems, seven days, eight days perhaps. So that's one of the uh, considerations. When you talk about erosion, there is one study where they show that central Luzon essentially, and a good part of Metro Manila, it's high risk to soil erosion. So then again, when you think in terms of uh, flood control, the hydraulics of flow, which sits on soil or the riverbed, and then the riverbed changes, then that's another issue. So floods, in, in other words, in our country, being steep slopes with the, with the archipelagic setting, you could change things. And so when you talk about flood control, you have to think about sediment transport because the river system, the river landscape changes a lot with the big rains and then the steep slopes. Uh, this is a plot uh, showing the urban dimensions of flooding. This is a case of uh, Pasig Marikina. We have, again, very uh, nearby Sierra Madre, Quarry, Cainian, maybe, and so on. So deforestation, so you can think now a lot of sediments could come down right away. You have, of course, garbage. You have these uh, informal settlements in the near Laguna Lake, within Laguna Lake, and then even in our Mangan floodway. So those are things that we have to deal with when in an urban setting. And that's where we really get uh, flood disasters because there's plenty of people. We have vulnerability and exposure factors. So when we talk about flood risk management or flood mitigation planning, we have to think in terms of holistic, in a sense that we not only talk about water resources uh, control or water resources uh, flood management, but you really have to integrate with land use management. Because again, as I mentioned, floods, uh, the medium of that is your land. And then of course, since it's very short to the coast in our case, we have to think in terms of from sea to uh, cloud to coast, because now with climate change, and so we have to think there's the dynamics of the clouds and then to the coast. So we have to think in terms of integrated water resources and coastal management. And of course, being uh, what we call, uh, what we're trying to push now is that the Philippines should really uh, look into or take advantage of our blue economy, because we have a lot of coastline. I think 3,000 or so, uh, or, or more kilometers, I forgot now. But then we have to think in terms of the interaction of the hydrology, the ecology, especially in the coastal areas where we have a lot of marine resources. And then of course, the geomorphology because you have archipelagic mountains and then steep slopes. So that's how we think in terms of a uh, flood management in an integrated manner, water, land, coastal, and of course you have your hazard uh, management. Now, if I think about floods, I think in terms of uh, what we call sustainability science, in contrast to based on traditional science. Now, 
if you look at this uh, this uh, figure at uh, this uh, table, when we talk about uh, comparing the two, we have to in, in terms of aim of study, mode of change, truth verification, result research, so on. In the case of traditional science approach to flood management, we only think in terms of uh, understanding flood and mitigating to protect human life and property. But in terms of sustainable science, we have to think in terms of uh, not only for the human protection of human life and property, but also look at its relation to flora, fauna, and of course the people. And then we're not only looking at the impacts, adverse impacts, but even there are beneficial effects. What I mean by that is that like wetlands where you have biodiversity, you have all these uh, flora, fauna for our food, wetlands, uh, require flooding, <laughs> they, they need flooding. And then of course, flooding is non-stationary because we have climate change, we have land use change, social, political, and so on. And we'll see later on why the social, political, economic uh, dimensions come in. And in terms of, I, I already mentioned integrated flood management, covers land, coastal and hazard management, and then adaptive planning. I'm gonna show that what I mean by, and again, as far as the expected outcome, we wanted to minimize flood impacts and then maximize the benefits of floods to sustain ecosystem functions, to support flora, fauna, and especially human life. So if you, I think the bottom line here is that before when we think in terms of uh, the, the expected outcome, we want prosperity of human beings. But now in sustainable science, we wanted sustainability of the earth to support human beings. So that's that's a, <clears throat> the big distinction. So sustainable science actually was inspired by what we call transdisciplinary approach. In fact, transdisciplinary approach came in maybe in the 80s, 90s, and then they developed sustainability science as an arm to, to uh, uh, do your transdisciplinary approach. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, why flood risk management also is, uh, uh, con uh, we have to consider socioeconomic as well as the human system because we have to think in terms of the interaction, not only the physical system, not only the climate, hydrology, and the rivers, but socioeconomic objectives, norms and investments, and then the human systems. When we talk about garbage uh, management or waste management, then that's where the human uh, the, the attitudes or the uh, practices come in. And then in fact, when you have political ambitions, sometimes all of a sudden you have you allow subdivisions here and there without really looking at how it impacts our flood uh, flood regimes in the area. So in view of this, when we talk about transdisciplinary approach, what we need is to uh, <clears throat> solve or develop our flood risk management uh, uh, approach or uh, solutions based on this transdisciplinary approach, which involves uh, utilization of integrated knowledge. All the sciences are involved from natural to physical, even social and indigenous knowledge. And then of course, you really have to engage stakeholders. Why? Because they would be more knowledgeable what's going on in the community or on the ground. Maybe the consultants, academics, won't really see that. And then it's an iterative process. And I mentioned earlier that uh, flooding is non-stationary, changes with climate, social, political changes or land use. So it has to be iterative. In fact, later I'm gonna show you the adaptive planning where you have to keep on continuously updating your plans because of changes in, in uh, land use and so on. And then you have to think in terms of decisions are based on this hierarchical basis where 
First, you have to look at the physical laws and constraints. If you satisfy them, then you can think in terms of transcend to ecologically sustainable solutions, economically sound, socially justifiable, and lastly, politically acceptable. Because in our case, sometimes it's the other way around. We have this uh, money available, maybe in in a pork bottle, <laughs> then all of a sudden we need to have a project, even without looking at the physical constraints or physical laws that uh, govern. Uh, so they just have these water projects without looking at, is there, is it supported physically? And then finally, because of this uh, being iterative with changes that could happen fast in climate or land use, we need to employ adaptive planning rather than master planning. And this is just an example of adaptive planning where it's a continuous updating, interactive, uh, an inter, uh, and then iterative way of doing planning so that plans evolve by learning as you do it and doing as you learn it. This is an example where in maybe time one, you look at revisit flooding problems, you generate solutions, run uh, your simulations, computer simulations to evaluate performance of uh, your flood solutions, and then you prioritize, you implement, and then you reassess how they perform, update, revalidate solutions, and then you go back uh, step one here. So it's an iterative process for that matter. And in fact, that's the idea that maybe we have to make plans every five years. So that's really adaptive planning because uh, in five years, maybe new subdivisions are pop up here and there, new roads uh, come in. So you have to revisit and, revi and revise or update your plans for that matter. Another consideration when we talk about flood mitigation planning is, uh, is first of all, instead, uh, instead of going right away to engineered or structural uh, approach or uh, measures, perhaps you can restore. Look at natural features and see how you can uh, restore. So there's a, what we call nature-based uh, solutions. Otherwise, if you're not able to do it, you enhance. Maybe some alteration, enhancement here or there, and then finally, if you're not able to do that, you, you do your engineering approach. And in fact, that's what we now call uh, perhaps a uh, hybrid approaches to fly, uh, flood uh, planning. We have, in the case of uh, flood control and coastal resilience, uh, you could uh, purely do engineering approach. That's hard gray skillfully designed flood schemes using walls, embankments, and so on. On the other hand, you can have natural uh, nature-based solutions, but perhaps it's more feasible to have hybrid uh, combination of hard engineering as well as uh, ecosystem-based uh, uh, approaches. So things like here and there, maybe you have in the urban areas, some uh, green, uh, structures or green uh, uh, elements, or in your coastal areas, uh, you have this combination of structural and then you have the mangroves and things like that. Now, I'd like to present uh, some studies that I've done or projects that I've done, and then some ideas as far as uh, how, how flooding, uh, flood uh, solutions can be developed. This one case in uh, West Mangahan Road Dyke, that's uh, somewhere here in uh, the west uh, side of the Mangahan floodway in uh, Pasig, Taitai, Tagig uh, area. So that's uh, somewhere here. But anyway, in 2002, there was supposedly a project to build this road dike in west side of Mangahan floodway, but there was some opposition uh, by the communities, some fisher folks, 
some businesses and and so on. So we were, I, I was involved in doing a third party uh, evaluation as well as uh, revisit, uh, revisiting the plan. We call it value engineering to see how we can perhaps um, refine the project uh, during the time. So what happened was that the big, uh, one of the big opposition with the Fisher folks, and I'm gonna show you the area where that I'm talking about. So this took, uh, we, we did kind of a transdisciplinary approach. We had uh, eight big, big uh, town meetings, what you call stakeholder consultations. And we ended up with what we call this uh, alternative Lakeshore Dike configuration. So this is that part of Laguna Lake, this Mangan floodway. So the question is that, do you build a road dike, which will, uh, you'll have a pumping station, and then it's uh, directly going to be, uh, uh, I mean, it's going to protect uh, the, the, this area here, Lupang Arena, or you leave some portion for fish spawning, because that's one of the, the uh, opposition by the fisher folks around that area. And maybe you can have like a compromise. You have a roadway, but it's elevated. So then you can have uh, the fish uh, spawning uh, ground still retained. So you have a sort of a, the lake uh, waters can get into this uh, sort of a, a wetland and things like that. So we ended up uh, basically uh, doing this public consultation, explaining to the those different uh, stakeholders what we'll do, and then we ask them what you want to happen. Then we run the model, and then we go back to them. We tell them, okay, this is the effect. If you do this, if we do that, and so on. So from so many configurations, we ended up with six of them. And then on this basis, we did a full... Uh, analysis of what's the, how many families are affected, what will be the economic uh, benefit, the environmental impact, and so on. So what was built was this alternative 1B. And I think that's this one. It's it's built already, this part, where it, it kind of uh, compromises. Uh, you have this fish spawning area retained, and then you have this... Uh, full protection, the human settlements already in place. So that's the type of a iterative process with stakeholder uh, uh, involvement when you think about, when you do flood planning. So that's a, a real project that was implemented by DPWH uh, 2010 or something like that. There's another example of a, you engage stakeholders because uh, this is in Cagayan de Oro River, in uh, Cagayan de Oro City, where there was a plan after the Sendong uh, typhoon in December 2011. So they have a new flood mitigation plan. But again, there were oppositions. There was only one particular plan in the time. It was this case uh, 3A, this one. So there were so many oppositions. Some of them, oh, we, the dike uh, alignment, the flood wall, the retention, uh, the uh, the retarding basin should be located here or there. We are either we are inside the dike or outside. That means we are in the riverside as opposed to we are in the land side. So we entertain uh, those different concerns, and then we run simulation, then went back to them. You see, if you do this, do that. This is what will happen. One barangay gets flooded, another barangay may be protected, and so on. Anyway, finally, they they arrive at some compromise, but the, again, the process is iterative for that matter, where first of all, you listen to them, what they want uh, to happen, and then do the simulations, and then see what's the impact of that. And then finally, you'll have this uh, consensus building. You develop... Uh, you level up and then you decide, you come up with a much more acceptable uh, flood mitigation plan. And that's how, again, and in this case, I think the 
4A was the one implemented. This one, for the case four was the one implemented. So you can see there are some, what we call retarding basins here and there and so on. And then of course the alignment of the dikes uh, change or the flood walls change. This is an idea in the Kandaba swamp because I think, uh, I don't know, late last year after there was this uh, typhoon, I forgot uh, uh, President uh, Bongo Marcos was in Pampanga. There was an idea of uh, this Kandaba swamp to be, uh, to, 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 to build a ring dike so it, it will serve like a reservoir. But if I look at Kandaba swamp, it's a wetland to begin with, as well as uh, these, uh, you know, some important ecosystem services that it provides, being a natural flood detention during wet season. And then it's got this, uh, what we call wetland ecological function where there is this, as a wetland, there is this uh, frequency that is historically uh, maintained so much uh, area is flooded so much time in the year or things like that. So, and in fact, there is this study where you have key preservation areas as far as uh, these uh, migratory birds and, you know, the flora fauna where it uh, supports this uh, even, I mean, attracts migratory birds uh, in that area. So anyway, we think about uh, those flood dynamics. We have to think in terms of this historical wetland dynamics where so much area is flooded so much percent of the time. So if you wanted to modify that, then it will uh, perhaps uh, change the wetland dynamics to support flora and fauna. And there are studies that, what does it take that you have to have so much uh, area wet and so much uh, wet, uh, so much time of the year to support those uh, those uh, flora, then the migratory birds come in. So you can even look at some historical images where these are the preservation areas, they are flooded every now and then. So instead of diking the entire area, perhaps the idea here is to create a network of lakes. So a network of lakes where anyway, every now and then they become flooded, so many weeks a, a year. So why don't we just connect them so they can become, you know, a wetland as well as they still serve as a wetland and they can be even uh, uh, used for water supply storage for irrigation and so on. So that's the end. So, so if you have this low lying area here or there to take advantage that the water comes in here, it doesn't overflow you connect these two, you connect that, so that they will just balance off and then contain the flood waters instead of flooding downstream that will eventually get into your Santa Rita, San Simon area. So basically it's similar to this scheme where they connected all these small lakes so they will balance all these flood waters to be able to contain much better instead of going to again, San Simon, Santa Rita, and then even parts of uh, flooding your North uh, Expressway. Okay, this is another scheme. I mean, this is another idea where I've been proposing where the, the flood scheme of the Pasig Marikina River Basin in the 80s was that instead of this water from Marikina Basin, which is the largest basin in, in, in Metro Manila, gets to Pasig River, it will be diverted through Mangan floodway. This Mangan floodway, as you know, is a man-made uh, floodway to divert these uh, Marikina waters, temporary store in Laguna Lake, and eventually get out of uh, Laguna Lake after the big storm through Napindan or through this Paranyaki spillway. But this was never built. So the idea now is that they wanted to revive this idea of putting up a spillway, but the spillway now will not be an open channel, but it will be a tunnel 
there's a drop here, 30 meters, and then the tunnel, go to the other side and you pump it out to Manila Bay. But of course, uh, that could be an expensive project because you, you have to pump it out. Pumping cost may be exorbitant depending on how much and so on. But in any case, that's a... So that my idea is that why not, instead of uh, diverting to Laguna Lake and even flooding some Laguna uh, towns and then it takes about 90 days for water to get out through Napindan, without, of course, the Paranyagi spillway, why don't uh, divert the water all the way to the other side of the the Sierra Madre? Tunnel here all the way to this, either tunnel from this point, that's the upper Marikina, to Kaliwa River, and then let the Kaliwa flow into Agus River, and so on. So that this can be an idea, which was done in... Uh, in Iloilo, actually, we have done a similar scheme where this uh, Jaro River, instead of going to the city, this area here, they have this uh, floodway. So it goes directly to the sea. But in our case, uh, we cannot have a, a tunnel or, I mean, an open channel all the way to this side. It will be, you will flood so many cities or towns around in this area, but not in the case of Iloilo. In Kuala Lumpur, they've also done that. Instead of this big river clan going to Kuala Lumpur, they divert, uh, this one, they diverted it uh, directly to the sea. This is the sea part. So if you do this, I did some computations. Instead of the water during Typhoon Ondoy in the red, this red one, will overtop the black uh, river bank elevations. With a tunnel, it will, the the flood uh, in Marikina will just be the blue lines here, the blue dashed lines. So that's what you gain. Uh, this is just if you're looking from Marikina towards Manila, this is uh, what you see on the left side, and this is what you see on the right hand side. So you can imagine that we are around Marikina City, the left hand side of Marikina River will be SM Mall, the right-hand side will be your Provident Village. So here, you have fairly uh, reduced the flood elevations by that much. So it won't overflow this uh, flood wall in the Provident Village. The other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, when we design our flood uh, structures, it's based on this, what we call design storm which is uh, associated with a certain return period. I won't go to that, but uh, in the Philippines, uh, most of our major flood control projects are really uh, designed that provides a low level of protection to the people. So let's, let's just say maybe because we don't have so much money to invest, but in the Metro Manila Master Plan 2012, they have increased here and there a bit, maybe up to 60 or 50 uh, years return period. But again, I'd like to mention that this is only based on a single uh, peak storm. If we think in terms of a bagat, which is a prolonged seven-day storm, that's a different story. But anyway, so far, like for example, the Metro Manila Master Plan in 2012, it was based on a two-day storm, but only one peak when they... They don't even look at uh, multiple peaks. So anyway, that's uh, that's another issue that I think we have to look at that seriously. But anyway, with climate change and with land use change, I wanted to show you a, a simple study that I've done in Cagayan de Oro City, where if you look at the stream flow maximum, I have only daily data, it has been going up, I, I think. Evidently, graphically, okay, perhaps it's going up. And why? Because you have a changing uh, rainfall regime. It's going up also. It looks like we have the Sendong and then the Pablo. It really went up around this period. And then also urbanization. This is the percent of built up or the area of built up area in Cagayan de Oro City from 1960, 1990, 2020. So, if you think about uh, urbanization, if you pave a city 
if you have rainfall, those rain, instead of having opportunity to infiltrate into your previous areas, forest or grasslands and so on, no more opportunity to just go directly to the sea. So, I mean, to the river. So that's the reason why that you can have an increase in stream flow right away around this area in Kagandi or city, because all the waters that go directly to the to the to the rivers. So when we think in terms of uh, design return periods or design flow, we have to think in terms of uh, changing uh, what we call flood distributions, probability of occurrence of the floods magnitude in time. So this is the case where instead of looking at it stationary wise, it's non-stationary, but what is this non-stationary probability distribution in time? It's a function of the changing rainfall and the changing land use. And if you do that, you can then analyze that. If you look at this, uh, what you call the asymptotic uh, non-stationary return periods, if you base it on stationary analysis, in, in Kagan, uh, the stream flow, the 80 year, uh, the Sendong was actually about 80 years uh, return period. Asymptotically in the future, it will only be equivalent to a 15 year return period. That really means that an 80 year, one over 80, may be about 3% risk. But if you think there's about 15, that's almost 70% uh, 70 risk of flooding every time you have a storm. So that's a, a major. Uh, so if I look at the non stationary of Sendong rainfall, which happens to be 187, if you were doing non stationary analysis starting in the 80s or 2000, you could have thought that uh, Sendong. Uh, maybe 30 years from now, will be 243 millimeters instead of only 187 millimeters rainfall over, I think, that uh, six hour period. So, but the one I had, the study I, I presented, for example, here in Kagan de Oro, we run the simulation using the Sendong like rainfall. But maybe you should have really run simulations based on this non-stationary analysis sending rainfall instead of 187 millimeters converted into a flood hydrograph, we should run it with a 243 millimeters rainfall. Thinking that maybe 10 years or 20 years from now, we have change in climate, change in uh, climate in terms of rainfall or even urbanization. So we should have designed based on that. And this is a different simulation. If you have 187, these are the areas flooded this much, but if you have this one, you have much, much uh, bigger, I mean, flood depths will be higher. So that's, uh, I think that's my last slide. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> so again, I have, a, I sent a copy to Maribeth uh, of my presentation. So anyone interested, maybe you can just ask where I'm, Mary bit. Hi, Jerry. Thank you very much. Jerry, yeah. actually, WH. Uh, long time no see, Jerry. Thank you Thank very you. much, Dr. Pavios. Very, very interesting uh, presentation, and I'm sure it's a uh, really a good way to have a new perspective when it comes to uh, flood mitigation and control. And I'm sure many people who are watching would be asking a lot of questions later on.